We used to play a lot of pranks on each other. One night there was a guy that I was stationed with was uh, on CQ, charge quarters. And uh, while he was on CQ, we went down to his room in his Quonset hut and took his bed all apart and took it and put it up on top of the latrine. When he got off CQ, he, <laughs> he didn't have anywhere to go to bed. And then of course, they, uh, it happened to be that the, the latrine was right across the parking lot from where our headquarters was. Well, and it wasn't too long, here came the first sergeant. He called everybody out and uh, wanted to know <laughs> who put that up there <laughs> in so many words. <laughs> anyway, it was really funny. And nobody would admit to it. So, you know, everybody got the help taking Harry's bed down off the roof of the latrine and helping put it back up in his room so he could go get his sleep. So, that's, that's what we did with our leisure time. Around the time Steve was deciding to enlist in the armed forces, the Vietnam War was in full swing. The Gulf of Tonkin incident had occurred a few years prior, and America was going full speed into the war. Um, joined the Air Force in 66, September 66. Well, I was uh, never crazy about, you know, spending time on a confined ship, or, or at least that's what I thought. Uh, I thought I could get better training in the Air Force. I had tested, uh, I don't know, I remember if I tested for the Navy or not anymore, but I went and talked to the Army recruiter and blah, 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 and it sounded like, like uh, I was gonna end up probably in the infantry or something, but I tested well in electronics with the Air Force. Uh, and they had a, what they called at that time a delayed enlistment program. So I actually signed up in June, didn't have to report till September. So that's when my, my time began. When I went to basic, I had no idea what I was gonna be doing. And it was in Lackland Air Force Base down in Texas. And I got there September. And it was kind of hot, but it wasn't too bad. Air Force basics, nothing like the Army basic or Marine basic training. Um, so it, it wasn't that bad. I mean, I mean, working wasn't an issue and, and going through the training wasn't that strenuous. Uh, if you just put your mind to it, go do it. You, you got through it without a problem. Uh, they sent me off to uh, Fort Monmouth, New Jersey to go to TV school, which uh, the, the official designation was television equipment repairman. And uh, from there, we learned lots of stuff about broadcasting primarily and a lot of studio work and those kind of things. Got involved with, uh, well, I got stationed, um, like I said, at Fort Monmouth where I did the training. After that, I ended up going to Biloxi, Mississippi, Keesler Air Force Base. Mostly there, we did uh, training programs and, and aired them out to all the classrooms because uh, uh, Keesler is part of the Air Training Command. I have no idea what they call it today, but anyway, that's where they taught all of the Air Force people, uh, primarily electronics and, and all different kinds of categories, you know, courses and so forth. Kind of a advanced training. Once they've been through basic, then they go to Keesler. Um, then they get their advanced training there. So after, <laughs> after I was stationed at Keesler a while, I'd, I'd been dating a girl here and we decided to get married. So I got married in August of 68, and in January of 69, I got orders to go to Korea. Um, thought, what can I do in Korea? But lo and behold, they had a whole television network over there. The Korean War ended in an armistice between North and South Korea. Although there was written peace between the two countries, there was still tension. The demilitarized zone along the 38th parallel is what split North and South Korea. In 1965, Kim Il-sung, leader of North Korea, began looking to the Chinese for help with an invasion of the South. The Chinese decided against aiding in the invasion of the South. The North felt this was the time to attack because the South was sending soldiers to help in the fighting in Vietnam and they appeared to be weak. 
The conflict began when a UN patrol officer was attacked while patrolling the DMZ. Through this conflict, there were infiltrations and small attacks by the North. This conflict injured or killed nearly 849 South Koreans and 154 American soldiers. This conflict occurred between 1966 and 1969, the exact time Steve was stationed in Korea. When I first got there, uh, they assigned me to, they call it Charlie Block, which was near the town of Pajari, which was way up north. Uh, we could actually see North Korea from the top of the hill I was on, where we had a transmitter site. Uh, so that was exciting. That, that was, we never had any problems, but there, there were problems there. <laughs> um, I understand that during the year I was there, which was like 13 months, but during a one year period, around the time I was there, there were over 360 some infiltrations from the north. So that, and, and of course there was a big fence line that divided the two, uh, and, and on either side of the fence was what they called the DMZ. Uh, it's a military demarcation line was where the fence was, the border. And on either side of that was this DMZ. It was a zone that nobody went into. And the North Koreans would figure out how to come over to the south side, you know, and they, they, these guys all had what they called Claymore mines set up. And I don't know anything about Claymore mines, I was in the Air Force, we didn't deal with that. But I was stationed with the Army more than I was the Air Force during my time because of being in television. So anyway, they, <clears throat> these guys would come over, take these Claymore mines, which were a directional thing, and then actually turn them around because initially they were facing north <laughs> to try to repel anybody that was not supposed to be there. They turn them around and do all kinds of things. And, and there's just all kinds of incidents that happened during that time. That I wasn't really involved, but I heard some things, <laughs> you know, things that, that uh, uh, well, things that happen when you have sort of a war going on, I guess. I, I don't know that Korea was ever a war. I know it was a police action. Um, everybody calls it the Korean War. I'm just not sure that that was official. I, I don't know. That, that was above my pay grade. <laughs> but there were things going on. Like I said, these infiltrations, you know, those weren't supposed to be happening. The uh, one instance I know where there were some guys that got pinned down, they were patrolling uh, the DMZ and uh, they were in a Jeep and anyway somebody sh shot at them from across the border from an outpost over on the North Korean side and shot a couple guys up and they were trying to get in to get them out of there. They were pinned down and, and nobody would allow them to throw smoke, okay, they, they've got cannons, I guess, or whatever. There's there's all kinds of ways of doing it. But anyway, they, they wanted to lob smoke grenades over so because the wind was from the north and let it blow back across where these guys were so they could cover them and go in and get them out. Well, that didn't happen. That didn't happen. And I guess it turned dark before somebody made a decision to do anything. And then it started snowing. And uh, they sent a helicopter in to get these guys out. I guess the helicopter crashed. and. You know, like I say, this is all kind of speculation. Heard about it, but it wasn't too far from where I was. We couldn't see it where I was, but it was kind of interesting being that close to the, <laughs> the border. Although there were bad interactions with the North Koreans, interactions with the South Koreans were pretty peaceful and friendly. We, we had some Koreans that we worked with uh, that were contractors, that, a couple of guys. There were several of them that, <laughs> that uh, on our compound uh, at the top of the hill that we were on at AFKN, uh, they had their own little hooch kind of Quonset hut, part of a Quonset hut. And uh, <clears throat> they'd go take their breaks there and eat lunch there to get together and do all that stuff. And they did all their Korean food, you know. And, and uh, once a month, they would invite some of us GIs to join them in their hooch. And a couple times while I was over there, we actually did a, a pig uh, luau. One of the guys, we'd go dig a big hole, not next to the patio, 
about four feet deep, start a fire in there with a bunch of old scrap wood, throw a bunch of rocks in. Somebody get a pig someplace and then wrap it all up in screen and leaves and stuff and throw it in a hole, cover it back up and four hours later, it was delicious. <laughs> and of course, one of their customs was at the end of everybody being served, we go down to their hooch and they'd always have the head there and you get to eat the eyes and the brain and all of those kind of things. So it was, it was interesting. <laughs> AFRTS, okay, is American Forces Radio and Television Service. When I was in, we uh, had our headquarters uh, in Seoul, Korea. Um, from there, we broadcast all kinds of AFRTS network stuff and, and we made some of our own local shows and I brought a little information on some of that um, and mostly it was just satire. We had a bunch of goofy guys that worked there and, and they'd dress up like space cadets of some kind or other <laughs> and it was kind of based on a theme like you would uh, 2001 only it was uh, the movie 2001 Space Oddity and uh, or, or I think that's the name of it. Anyway uh, it was kind of interesting. These guys, it was, it was mostly meant to be funny and, and fun for GIs. There was uh, a whole myriad of programs. They had lots of, uh, uh, a lot of health related stuff. Um, they had some that you'd probably consider propaganda, you know, uh, not not to the point like it used to be in World War II where you go sit in a movie and you'd see the newsreels and those kind of things. Uh, but we did have some of that kind of stuff that we would air. Um, and it was, uh, but, but then they, they would air programs, uh, how to learn to speak Korean, you know. And, and of course, no advertisements in any of this stuff. Uh, we would have dignitaries come over there uh, on USO tours. We had them come in there Well, in fact, I was saying earlier that probably a favorite dignitary that I met when I was over there and actually got to shake her hand and, and helped her put on her lavalier mic, which was kind of interesting, but her name's Gypsy Rose Lee, okay? So she was really neat, quite a lady, um, just as, and I don't remember how old she was. She had to be probably in her 70s at the time, I'm guessing. Um, but boy, she was just as full of life as could be. And she came in there, you know, she wasn't all dressed up or dialed up or anything, but we were gonna do an interview similar to this. And, and uh, she went to put the mic on. There was one of the guys asked her, you know, uh, you know, and she just grabbed it, stuck it up in her dress, reached down, pulled it up, clipped it on, and, and away she was, I'm ready. <laughs> That was really kind of funny. Hubert Humphrey, I met when I was over there. He was campaigning to be president at the time. Uh, and there's other people too. Like I say, they come through and interview in the studio as they were in the country. And uh, maybe, like I say, going to USO shows at different compounds around the country. And it was good promotion for them. Uh, we actually televised the uh, moon landing uh, the first moon landing, Apollo 11. Uh, we set up a 20 foot by 40 foot large screen TV or screen in a park in downtown Seoul. And then we got a video projector, first time I'd ever seen a video projector. And it, it was fit in the back of our remote van. And uh, we projected this whole thing. Every night we go down there and, and fire up our link, the, the microwave link back to the studio, get this feed run it through and project it out on this big screen and, and thousands and thousands of Koreans would come out and just sit and watch this. So that was kind of a neat little public service thing, you know, kind of fun. Um, as I mentioned before, we'd go out and do remotes on Saturdays and we'd always go to uh, like the, they had what they called recreational compounds, RC4, RC2, all these different places where the GIs could go off the base. I mean, it was, it was on the base, but it was 
then they could get out of their barracks, you know, and didn't have to, they, they could just go sit there and relax and without being in a mess hall or, or something absolutely related. And they always had TVs in there. And it's amazing how many times we found those guys actually watching those goofy shows that we did. Well, I, 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 there are probably a lot of areas that, if it comes down to budget cuts, that would probably be one of the first things that I would have to cut or, or cut back. And I wouldn't eliminate it altogether because I think it's really important for people from this country, if they do get sent overseas, it's nice to be able to go look at a TV and, and have at least one channel there that you can look at and, and say, oh, I understand these people. And, and the fact that we made some goofy TV shows that were just silly, you know, it, it let them have a, a, a little chance in their day that they could go and smile, you know. And, and that was the object of it. You know, that's why we were goofy as we were silly, you know. So it served a purpose. Um, should we have bombers and tanks prior to that? Sure. <laughs> you know, better, better weapons, better, better uh, suits and stuff for all the guys that are out there, the foot soldiers? Absolutely. You know, that's way more important. But, but don't get rid of it altogether. I think probably the thing that hurt me the most was that I missed my first anniversary of my wife. Yeah. Of course, there was no cell phones, so I, or was there? No, there wasn't cell phones. But somehow I got to call her that day, I know that. So, yeah, that, that was, yeah, anyway. We've been together 46 years now, so. Although Steve was not sent to Vietnam, upon his arrival home, the presence of anti-war protest was still prevalent and coming back, getting out of the service at that time, wasn't a very popular thing to do back in this country uh, because there was all of the Haight-Ashbury crew and, and it's an area in San Francisco where lots of people were, or I think it's San Francisco, where they're protesting and all kinds of things. Um, and, and a lot of music in those days was protest songs, you know, protesting the war. And I liked some of that music, but I, I still had signed up, I had a job to do, and I was gonna do it to the best of my ability. Now, quite honestly, uh, I was never in combat. Um, I, being in television, it's a pretty good job <laughs> compared to toting a rifle or running around a rice paddy. But I never really experienced uh, too much problem in that regard. After I got out, I hadn't been out too long, and I was working at Channel 23 here in Rockford. And uh, I was only off for a couple of weeks, and I, I, out of, when I got out of the service and got offered a job out there. While I was working there, uh, CBS, which it was a CBS affiliate at the time, still is, but it's, it was WCEE in those days, okay? So they changed the call letters. It still operate on the same frequency and all that stuff. But anyway, they were coming out with a TV show, MASH, and because I had spent time in Korea, those guys got me to go do the promo for the TV show MASH. That was kind of the only time I was ever on air. <laughs> that was kind of dumb, but it, it, it was cute, I guess. That's what everybody said, so. You know, I've done a lot of stuff through my life, uh, and it was because I had some skills. <laughs> but I, I learned those skills when I was young. I learned how to work, you know? I learned how to not be afraid to get my hands dirty. Um, so, you know, and I, I shouldn't be bragging, but, but my point is, uh, I went to high school, I graduated from Harlem in 65, uh, and I had a pretty good basis for what I needed to do. Uh, I worked at uh, AMROC for about a year before I went in the military, uh, 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 pulling parts, you know, I mean, I was a stock chaser, but that's okay. Then I went in the military, and that's where I really got my electronic background. I, I had done some electrical stuff at, in high school, but that's where I got the electronics background, and, and then enhanced that after I got out working at different places, and ultimately went to work at Chrysler and retired from there. So um, I, I was pretty lucky. So what has being a part of the Harlem Veteran Project taught you? Being part of the Harlem Veteran Project has really taught me responsibility. 
the like responsibility of making a documentary based on someone's life and time in the service seems like a lot and giving it to a high school student you really have to learn how to budget your time and learn to meet deadlines and it has really taught me how to do that. What was it like the first time that you got to meet Steve? When I first met Steve at the uh, Pasta Victory Dinner fundraiser and I knew he was going to be there but I was not prepared and I was kind of uh, like starstruck when I met him and um, talking after the dinner was very nice actually getting to meet the person I've been watching on my computer for all school year was, was a surreal moment for me. What is one thing that Steve has taught you this year? Steve has taught me that you don't always have to be on the front lines. During Korea, he was not on the front lines. He made film for the soldiers to watch that gave them some relief from the war, which was probably the hardest time of their lives. He just really taught me that success does not mean you're always in the front lines, that all parts have to come together to create success. Okay, and if you could say one thing to Steve, what would it be? I would like to say thank you. Thank you for sharing your story with the Harlem Veteran Project and allowing me to make a documentary based on your life and time in the service.